Greetings. In this video, I'm joined by AP Strange. Feel free to introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. AP Strange here. Not really sure what to say about myself. I'm a complete weirdo, <laughs> amateur paranormal researcher, and researcher into all things weird, Discordian, and member of the Magonia Research Group and Luminal Earth. And the Magonia Research Group is where we actually met. I joined uh, Magonia in 2019. It's, um, you know, done over Discord and group text and stuff like that. Um, I was the 33rd member, you know, cue the spooky music. So how long have you been a part of that group? I think it was the beginning of 2020 when I joined the group. I asked one of our leaders, Humanoid Lord, what it was all about, and he just kind of added me. So I found myself in the group, and uh, it's been it's been fun. You know, it's I got to meet you, I got to meet other people, so it's been an enjoyable experience. Humanoid Lord contacted me over Twitter uh, in DMs and just asked if I wanted to join uh, back in 2019, I think maybe late 2019, somewhere around there. I, I'd never used Discord before, so I had to figure all that out, and once I did, it was pretty cool. Kind of the modern equivalent of some of these uh, research groups you'd have back in the day, you know? It was like message boards and stuff. Yeah, or just like the classic, you know, saucer clubs, but instead yeah. it's done digitally and stuff like that. I think at least you and I try to make it that way where we're like sending clippings back and forth and stuff. <laughs> yep. And uh, unlike my society that I have now, the Appalachian Mystery Society, Magonia is more international. So there are people from all over the world there. So I really enjoy you know, popping in there for that kind of perspective. You know, I go to my team in the Mystery Society to talk about very specific West Virginia, Appalachia related stuff. But then when I want to talk more like generally and the phenomena as a whole, I often go into Magonia and sort of ask questions and see if other people have any knowledge that's beyond what you could find on Wikipedia, stuff like that. Right. And so I really liked your, your comments that you leave there. Very uh, informative and very helpful. You've actually recommended a few uh, books that I've picked up that have been really good. And helpful for my research was that the the occult books that i recommended yep you recommended those and uh the world's strangest stories where the point pleasant blimp thing is in the the phantom blimp right right yeah i find myself returning to that book pretty often i was i was just looking at it the other day actually so um i thought i hadn't heard of that before but then i looked through my my notes about mary hire and Mary Heyer actually did send uh, some information about the, the phantom blimp crash to John Keel in one of her clippings, Where the Waters Mingle. She had talked about that, uh, brought that back to my attention, and I got that book. And, um, you know, I included a, a write-up of the blimp crash on my database of anomalies. So, yeah, it's a really cool thing. It shows that strange stuff's been happening in Point Pleasant for a, a long time, all the way back in the 1930s. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's just such a weird story. I mean... Um... I don't know if we should recap basically what it was, but it, it was kind of just a um, a blimp that a bunch of people saw and appeared to be falling out of the sky and crashing into the Ohio River, mm -hmm. right? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a phantom blimp crash. People see a, a blimp that crashes, but then there's no uh, debris. There's no one found. It's just, uh, you know, not really there. The blimp that wasn't yeah, there. No, no blimps unaccounted for or anything like that. Yeah, very strange. And it's it's really cool because it's just one of those obscure things that falls through the cracks. It's not exactly a mystery airship because it's uh, it's in the wrong era for that, you know. Um, yeah, all those but... great um, like mystery dirigibles and stuff like that. It kind of brings yeah. to mind that stuff or like a proto UFO type stuff. Yeah, it's like right in the middle. But, I think it was nineteen thirty one. 31 yeah yeah so it's right in between I, I mean there was the 1897 airship stuff and then there were more in the um 19 teens and then you know like of course the kenneth arnold thing was in, in 1947 so it's kind of smack dab in the middle between those those two uh iterations of the ufo phenomena and just kind of an anomaly right in the middle it's super cool and the fact that it's point pleasant is uh i think is significant but it's a fun little obscure story those are the ones that i that i tend to really love the most is the ones that people don't often talk about i actually found uh an even older mason county anomaly that uh is from 1883 and it's like a, a black dog ghost and it was published in the, the Weekly Register on May 9th, 1883. It's essentially people seeing uh, this black dog that chases them along the road, uh, chases people walking or riding horses, and uh, they couldn't outrun it, and the being was shot at and uh, couldn't be killed. People threw rocks at it with no effect. So yeah, just a classic kind of black dog ghost. Wow, that is interesting, because that's like a very UK thing. There's a lot of that in the UK, you know. Yeah, um, it's very early, so maybe people brought the concept over. 
Right, because there was a lot of um, a lot of like Celtic people in that area, right? A lot of Irish and mm-hmm. Scottish and in the Appalachians, so it could have been brought, uh, yeah, you know, brought over either as folklore or as an actual, you know, entity. Uh, I love the black dog stories out of the UK; those are super interesting. There was one in uh, Massachusetts as well in the 1970s, more in my neck of the woods. The uh, Abington Beast. I don't know if you ever heard of that one. Nope, not aware. Uh, it was it was actually killing people's livestock and stuff. I think it tore a horse's throat out at one point, but it was just ongoing for a couple of weeks in the town of Abington, which is somewhat near Boston. I mean, if anybody's not from Massachusetts, they assume everything's close to Boston, but it was actually somewhat close to there. But um, yeah, weird because it's it's like a well populated town, and there were these reports of this large dog, and then these horses, and I think some sheep were killed by something, and they never did find. It. That was as recent as the 70s. I think Lauren Coleman wrote about the Beast of Abington. Always with the animal mutilations. Be a UFO story or a monster story or a ghost story, there's often animal mutilations. Right, right. It's uh, it's difficult to think about, you know, because it's it is kind of grisly, but it's also it's just kind of ponderous because you wonder well, what the motivation is or or why, you know, why why would that happen? Not a normal thing for predator to kill something and leave it. I wasn't actually aware of what state you're from. So you're from Massachusetts? Yes. Yep. Uh, I'm, of course, from West Virginia, home of the Mothman and the Flatwoods Monster and God knows what else. Yeah. I mean, you got great stories down there. As I understand it, the Appalachians can be kind of a, a spooky place. But we are still part of the same mountain trail because the Appalachian, the mountains that run up through New England are still part of that App- Appalachian range, technically. So, and I think we I, it might have some uh, cavern entrances that that <laughs> might be somehow connected. So we're only far away in some respects. Uh, I'll be honest, though, I haven't read much about Massachusetts and sort of the New England area. I see Lauren Coleman write about that a lot. Yeah, Coleman lived in Massachusetts for quite a while. He lived in Massachusetts for a number of years when he started really writing a lot of books and uh, currently resides in Portland, Maine with his uh, International Cryptozoology Museum, which is an awesome place. He's got a small UFO section that he includes because some of the humanoids, like the Dover Demon, Mm -hmm. he was the one that coined the term Dover Demon. Yeah, a lot of people kind of compare that to like a gray alien. So he has like a little alien corner in there with uh, Kelly Hopkins, Bill Goblins and stuff like that. I got to uh, meet him briefly when I was there last summer. The the Dover Demon was the one I was thinking of. That's like, you know, when I think of Lauren (laughs) Coleman, that's typically the monster I think of is the Dover Demon. Him and Jerome Clark, they they wrote about that in like the, the 70s, you know, in one of their earliest books. Yeah, yeah. All of New England uh, with, with like... Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, all all have pretty weird stuff going on in them. And uh, each state has a distinctly different flavor. But um, when, when you're driving through them and, and you get to know the history and some of the odd things that have happened here, you get a feel for how spooky it is. It kind of makes sense that Stephen King lives in Maine or that H.P. Lovecraft wrote all his stories in, in Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> you know, There's also but, uh, um, the Bridgewater Triangle. That's another one I, I would think of. Yep, absolutely. I think I may have pinned down where the puck wedges live um and i might try to check that out at some point but there was a there was an island mentioned in david weatherly's strange intruders seems like it would be a good place to go investigate but i'm told the hockabock swamp isn't really it isn't the kind of place that beginners should try to hike through without help (laughs) because uh you can end up getting hurt or lost in there so i know at least there was like a winged creature sighting there that coleman talks about in like mothman downy uh was a witness and it was like in the hockabock swamp yeah and um, I mean, there's been all kinds of weird things cited there. There were the, the Pukwudgies, of course, winged creatures, uh, Sasquatch-like things, ghosts. And there's a ledge there that, that people are compelled to jump off of, whether they actually do it or not. But, you know, some people feel this urge to just like jump off the cliff when they're up there a lot of weird things about that swamp area the lore of course goes back to the indigenous people in the area which in our day and age now kind of kind of a dubious thing people tended to in past times really attribute a lot of this stuff to indigenous lore that may or may not have existed but there is an actual history there with king philip's war the native chief they called king philip is he was actually called Metacomet. Meta's end around there so that's why people think 
the place is kind of cursed. But they had always kind of, the Hockamock name, I think they translate to something like something to do with devils. But then again, colonialists and then imperialists always try to attribute something devilish to the native culture. So uh, I'm not really sure what to make of it, honestly. I know that there is uh, like folklore and spirituality everywhere, no matter where you look. But um, I think when there are certain places where there's a lot of it, often you'll find there is like a really good investigator that lives there. You know, like you'll find a lot of good stuff about New Jersey. And a lot of it comes from Ivan Sanderson because he lived there at the time. And then you'll find a lot of good stuff about West Virginia in the 60s and stuff because Mary Heyer was there to document all the strange happenings in her town of Point Pleasant. So, right. you know, and you also had John Keel making a few trips down there and staying in touch with the people through Mary and uh, interviewing people about UFOs and their strange encounters. And you also had Gray Barker, you know, maybe a little less, uh, you know, helpful, but still someone who was talking to witnesses and publishing contactees and all that good stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, and you got Linda Godfrey now. Yeah, you know, a lot of people like that. They'd cover their local area. And it's hard not to. Yeah, so I feel like there there could be like tons of great places that just don't have a very good uh, like folklorist or uh, citizen journalist out there to document it. So, you know, if more people in more places started paying attention and interviewing their locals and putting their ear to the ground, so to speak, I think that there would be a ton of folklore just from everywhere. Probably. I think that's kind of catching on now. I think it's becoming more more of a thing. Social media tends to accelerate the folklore aspect of it, but I think it tends to be more short-lived unless something really catches on, you know? Yeah, well, then there's like net lore and stuff that comes like directly from the internet. Sometimes like folklore that is collected and then first posted uh, on the internet. And then sometimes a lot of fiction that becomes uh, folklore on the internet or becomes net lore. Um, yeah, and then it sometimes becomes th something that people actually see. <laughs> uh, the first example of net lore is actually the Jupacabra, because that was in the 90s when uh, the internet was first uh, becoming a thing that affected that sort of thing, and it actually affected the way that story, uh, you know, propagated. So it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, especially the um, mangy dog Jupacabra. Mm -hmm. that, that became a whole phenomenon on its own that uh, had nothing to do with the original Jupacabra reports, you know. Yeah. Um, that was always something that really bugged me because I, I loved the Chupacabra stories from Puerto Rico and stuff. And then when they tried to prove what they were in like Mexico or Texas or something, they're like, oh, we got this mangy dog. And you're like, that's not even close to the descriptions of. <laughs> yeah, there really is like two different types. Right. And um, I kind of yeah. look at the Chupacabra as kind of like a um, almost a personification, but not a person, of course of the concept of a cattle mutilation attributing a cattle mutilation to something so like this is the yeah. the being that we should attribute all of our cattle mutilations and animal mutilations to when back in yeah. the past it would have been like a you know a vampire or if it was during a ufo wave it would have been a ufo and so you know i kind of look at the jupacabra as just that because its name of course goat sucker it's kind of specifically that phenomenon that's being addressed with that creature yeah and i mean you see the same kinds of archetypes playing themselves out over and over again and, and just taking new forms every time, you know, or taking a form, because in the earliest accounts of you know, old, old vampire lore, if you read like Montague Summers' books on, on vampires, he talks about they, they're like formless, you know, sometimes they could leave the grave as a, a phantom without a corporeal form and still draw the life energy from somebody. And and a lot of times it's what we would think of as more of a psychic vampire. Yeah, that's and, more the, the Japanese vampires are more psychic vampire yeah, but the, the Western one was too, you know, um, hmm. at, at one point in history. And then over time, it became, you know, actually physically rising from the grave. You know, uh, it's a, that was a more a relatively recent invention as far as that's concerned. Because, um, But now you see different iterations of it, not only with the Chupacabras, but like with Black Eyed Kids. That always made me think of vampires because it seems like they need permission. Yeah, they have to, to be invited in. Right. And that's totally a vampire thing, mm -hmm. you know. Sometimes the way men in black behave is sort of, or or the way they appear, where they seem to have really pale skin and they seem to be covered up wearing all black, wearing sunglasses, like they might be sensitive to the light. I've always thought of the men in black as more kind of like in their later form as more Grim Reaper type characters. Yeah, they absolutely have the Grim Reaper thing going on as well. Uh, to your point earlier, the different frameworks can kind of tie into the cattle mutilation to the point that I've seen flesh and blood Sasquatch researchers or like flesh and blood dogman researchers 
researchers uh, attribute animal mutilations to these animals and say it's part of their eating habit or something something so the you can see that happening as well as you know becoming more physical you're talking about vampires being taken more literally and being more physical bloodsuckers that same thing there Oftentimes it's just like, what is the other? What is this bizarre thing that we can blame all of our mystery on? Like what's something weird happened? Uh, if we live in Ireland, then it was the fairies. If we live in the, the South during a UFO wave, then it was the UFO people. And so just on and on with, you know, attributing explanations to the, the beings that we're not quite sure what they are. That seems to be the way that goes. Yeah, and having having a need to uh, label everything and ha a way to organize it in a way such that it makes sense when uh, very little of it actually does. <laughs> but it, it's a lot of it's a lot of recurring motifs that just kind of get jumbled around, so that there's always some kind of monster there. Even with the big dog sightings that we were talking about, you know, that touches on werewolf lore. So what I was saying earlier is um, that I've, I've had people come to me saying that there's no interesting folklore where they live. And I really don't believe that. I think that, you know, as long as there are people around, there is interesting folklore. You just got to kind of look for it. You got to ask around and then you'll find some of it, some folklore in waiting that is just, you know, needs to be documented and, and recorded in some way. And then you'll have your folklore. Yeah. And I mean, when you do find sometimes, sometimes the stuff is really hidden in plain sight because, uh, all right. So my hometown of Worcester, Worcester Massachusetts, it's right dead center in, uh, of, uh, Massachusetts pretty much. It's, uh, it's the second biggest city in New England. Right in the center of the city is a statue called the Burnside Fountain. Nobody calls it that, though, because they always call it Turtle Boy. The statue is of a young boy pulling a giant turtle out of the water. It doesn't look like that's what he's doing because he has the back end of the turtle situated at his hips. And <laughs> it looks like he's doing something pretty untoward to the turtle. So it's kind of a quirky, weird statue behind City Hall. But there is like this weird folklore element to it where the artist that was commissioned to make the fountain itself, and this is on the Wikipedia page, but I'd love to investigate it further. I looked into it a little bit more and was able to figure out that it's at least somewhat true, like the dates match up at least. The guy that was commissioned to make the statue itself, that's become like a symbol for the city and the source of a lot of laughs for a lot of people, committed suicide halfway through. Uh, and believed that the statue was talking to him. So you put two and two together, the Turtle Boy statue talked this guy into killing himself. Like, that's some pretty weird folklore that's just kind of hidden in plain sight in the middle of the city. That's and, uh, some real weird stuff, like um, the art taking on its own life there. Yeah, or the guy just went nuts making it, but yeah. either way, that's some spooky, weird stuff, you know? And um, I had tweeted about that a couple of times, and then somebody somebody else got a hold of it, I think on TikTok or something, and then all of a sudden, thousands of people around the world know about this weird statue in Worcester. So, who knows? There's always, like, something that, that, you, could, that you could find out about that's, uh, you, you know, might be right beneath your feet or hidden in plain sight, like I just said, you know? Just asking around sometimes or asking questions about a statue that you walk by every day might, might be really revealing. It makes me think of people putting their mindset into the art they're making and you know, art being an expression of the spiritual and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there, there's something to that for sure. I mean, I like the idea of haunted paintings. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stories that are probably bogus out there, haunted artworks or even just cursed objects in general. It's a fascinating subject. I mean, that's basically an occult science is, is a talismanic object. So you, you'd be putting your intent into something that you created through through artwork and through well, artisanship if you were making a talisman or something. But the talismanic aspect of it could be applied to any number of things. Uh, actually, when, when Aleister Crowley would release a book, he would have it printed on very specific paper, very specific inks and stuff like that, and then he would release the book on, on an auspicious day for release. And the whole idea was that every book printed would be its own talismanic object if you had the that edition of it. It's really cool and interesting stuff when you think about it. So it's not too far of a reason for me to believe that there could be this spirit that inhabits the turtle boy statue whether or not the guy put it there you know mm -hmm. um maybe it was a some something that he he summoned that he could then lost control of or <laughs> or yeah. somebody else did uh, i definitely see the idea of spirituality being part of the creative process you know there are certain things that have this people make that have an eerie quality and there is fiction that takes on a life of its own 
and there are things that are attributed, uh, you know, divinely, like divine inspiration. And uh, I think of like William Blake and his paintings and things like that. Yeah, right. absolutely. And uh, it's all a matter of how you define it, I guess, right? Because they all seem to be some aspect of some other reality that's uh, um, that touches on or overlaps this one. I mean, because where do ideas come from? You know, <laughs> if, if something comes to you and falls right in your lap, you could call that a synchronicity or you could call it divine providence. At any rate, you're recognizing there was something otherworldly about it. And there were a lot of the classic Fordians who were also, you know, sci-fi writers. And there were a lot of sci-fi stories that are based on Charles Fort and sort of the ideas he came up with, including, uh, you know, teleportation as a term he coined. So if all of that can come from Charles Fort, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting how that works. A lot of folklore ties into stories and a lot of stories tie into folklore. Yeah, I've made a clumsy metaphor of it before by saying that when you're talking about fiction versus reality versus hoaxes perpetuated by somebody versus, you know, misidentifications or urban legends and your real life actual monsters it becomes kind of a chicken and the egg search right like a big philosophical question about well you know did this idea come from this fiction writer originally and then people started seeing it or did people hoax it based on the story or was it something that somebody actually saw that the fiction writer then based a story on or was it all an urban legend so it becomes less a chicken and the egg and it becomes more of like a rooster's egg from which a chimera is born mm -hmm. and that's what we're dealing Dealing with is a chimeric reality that, that it doesn't need to be either or it's just is what it is uh like the Loch Ness monster has a reality of sorts uh whether or not there's an actual prehistoric beast living in Loch Ness it's a real thing you can say Loch Ness monster to anybody and they know exactly what you're talking about I was going to say that, um, you know, Alan Greenfield, he wrote about uh, something that Gray Barker did where Gray Barker would call up um, a town and say he saw a UFO. And then people would uh, in that town also start reporting to see a UFO. And it could be either now they're looking up in the sky. Now they're more aware. Um, it could be like the whole concept of, a, you know, a thought form or a tulpa or something like that. Um, or it could be simply they've been given the permission to have that sort of imagination or they've been given the permission to report the audit in their life because um with the whole mothman wave if you look at that it's like the floodgates came open like everyone just decided okay it's it's kind of socially acceptable right now to share when we experience something mysterious you know regardless of what it is it starts off with just you know the ufos and the mothman but mary Heyer starts recording like very strange things that are even beyond that and that's when we get into like high strangeness and stuff like that uh people who were not even psychic coming up with premonitions and ideas like that so you know people who uh, saw a supposedly real monster are now their houses are now haunted and uh, they're having weird visions and things like that so I do think yeah. that um, a wave is it could be like the phenomena or whatever we're dealing with decides this is the time and the place or it could be simply okay we're now allowed to talk about what happens every day anyway yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it has to do with uh, suggestion and, and human psychology, for sure. But I mean, really, what is reality beyond that? Or it's just our perception of things, you know? I was like, thinking about that in the sense of the Kenneth Arnold sighting. Just came across, I don't know if you saw the clipping I shared, but it was a um, uh, Amazing Stories magazine from October of 1947. So it's like the editorial page in the front is Ray Palmer talking about the Kenneth Arnold sighting like it's news you know mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm like uh, I thought it said 1941 on the cover when I bought it so I wasn't sure what I'd get but then I'm like oh this is 47 that's awesome <laughs> but yeah in the wake of the Kenneth Arnold sighting all of a sudden there were saucers all over the country and, and a lot of ufologists have have written that off over the years saying like well you know a lot of people just jumped on board with it a lot of people just kind of kind of, it was kind of a mass hysteria thing or people felt that was a great time to hoax it and cash in and I'm sure there was a lot of that but it could just be that a lot of people saw stuff that they had no language for mm -hmm. and just the term flying saucer now existing means that they do now <laughs> they have words for it you know yeah and then so, there's the whole thing uh about if the term flying saucer was even like the right term to use because kenneth arnold later said that what he meant was that it was saucers skipping across the water he compared the things he saw to like saucers skipping across the water and said they weren't like saucer shaped and what he drew was kind of like more boomer Rang, like but then people saw like saucers yeah he also described them as being sort of like flying flying fish 
And it always amused me thinking of what would have happened if that term had caught on instead of flying saucers. <laughs> yep. Flying fish sightings. Yeah. <laughs> We'd but all be you, seeing flying fish. If you read some of those early UFO reports in uh, you know the late 40s, early 50s, they're calling them flying saucers even when they're not saucer shaped because that's just the term they have for them now. And yeah. uh, of course, that changed in 1953 when the U.S. Air Force came up with the phrase UFO and um, people started calling them that. And that's also, you know, people look looked back to people like Charles Fort, who had been talking about these bizarre lights in the sky and, you know, sort of proto UFO stuff that Charles Fort was writing about in the thirties and twenties and stuff like that. So people were able yeah. to kind of recontextualize this alongside earlier reports and all the way back to the ancients. And people start talking about like UFOs in the Bible and, you know, Ezekiel, he saw a spinning wheel and all this. And so, you know, people once once there's a big wave of some kind of popular concept or notion, then people kind of recontextualize what they see around it or they have a word for it now. And now it becomes a, a genre or a topic that people can identify with. Yeah, it's like a merry-go-round that uh, <laughs> the, the ideas just keep coming back around, you know. Yeah, it's and, always going to come back around again. And of course, there <laughs> there have always been lights in the sky. It's not like a, a new concept. I, I would agree with that. Uh, now, of course, they would call them Tic Tacs or whatever whatever else they were trying to call them now, like uh, UAPs or whatever. Well, back in my day, we called those cigar shaped UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, the fictional movie, actually has the word cigar shaped crafts in them. They talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Does, I remember does that, that come from like Adam Ski, like the mothership cigar shaped stuff? Well, I think it. I think it goes back to a Rupel, uh, the the Rupel UFO report, but definitely I think it was one of the government classifications of, of types of unidentified aircraft, hmm. but I could be wrong about that. I think the other word that they used for it sometimes was tubiform. Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there were always the cigar-shaped crafts, which really, if you saw a flying saucer side profile, it might look cigar-shaped, so there is that as well. But yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure where the cigar shape or Originates. I always like the term UFO. It's kind of hard yeah. to pronounce it right every time. I love that you're bringing that back. It makes me smile just hearing the word UFO. <laughs> I first heard that in um, the Mothman, uh, Search for the Mothman documentary from like 2002. John Keel said UFO and I was like, what the heck? Why is he pronouncing it like that? And then I looked into it like, oh, it's the right way to do it. Yeah, that was the original idea. And that that goes back to Rupelt, I think, the Rupelt UFO report. It's kind of like LOL or LOL, you know? Right, right. There's a lot of acronyms in the 60s and 50s. People like their acronyms. Well, especially Ivan, Ivan Sanderson. Yeah, like was... ABSM or something like that, Abominable Snowman. Right, yeah, he just, he went nuts with his acronyms. The, 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 because sometimes they didn't even really make sense. Part of a word and then part of another word. So, like, other intelligences would be oints. Yeah, oints. Or yeah. Uh, USO, an unidentified submerged object, which they used for both underwater UFOs and also for, like, you know, sea serpents and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And then technically, I guess the Tic Tac would be a USO. Hmm. Because it didn't it go under the water eventually. Yeah, like, I think they, they meant yeah. like more like when you sight it under the water, when it's sighted like coming up exactly. So I guess maybe. Um, but then yeah. there was a abominable swamp slob that John Keel threw out there, kind of tongue in cheek. If you put the <laughs> layers together there. Yeah, a lot of a lot of bizarre play with language. Yeah, and Sanderson and, was the best for that. And all the all the classic um, saucer groups, they all had their acronyms like APRO and NICAP and all that. KUFOS. Yeah, but now we got the Magonia Research Group. We got the MRG. Yeah. So I do have a few questions prepared here. The classic interview question, which is, how long have you been interested in the Fortean Sphere? Pretty much as long as I can remember. I, I had a really odd experience when I was very young with a pair of luminous entities in, in my bedroom at the foot of my bed that asked me a series of questions. And... Um, after which I fell asleep and had an out-of-body experience that gave me a brief glimpse of a couple of years in the future. Yeah, so ever since then, that kind of just set me on the path, I suppose. <laughs> that was a pretty weird thing to happen to me when I was five or six. So you would say there was like a, an actual like inciting incident. There was something that, that got you into the, the field and it was that? like Because um, I know some people, it's less cut and dry. It's about as far back as I can remember. You know, I don't have very many early, early childhood memories. But yeah, I mean, after that, especially when the realization that, you know, what I considered to be a dream, because of course your parents are going to tell you you were just dreaming and stuff like that. But I realized that after a couple of years that the glimpse I had gotten of the future, albeit a small one, was 
it was a legitimate thing that there was some strange reality going on you know so i mean i i got pretty heavily into parapsychology ghosts and esp and premonitions psychokinesis all that kind of stuff from a very young age it didn't tell me anything about itself it just asked me a series of questions about me that makes sense why that would get you into parapsychology yeah i mean i wanted to find answers and started with the reader's digest mysteries of the unexplained i think that was a gateway for a lot of people uh, are you familiar with that one uh nope Oh, it's, it's a book that, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you, so it's a book that like every pretty much tons and tons and tons of moms had <laughs> some of the, like Reader's Digest just offered it at some point. So a ton of people bought it. You can find copies pretty easy, but it's, it's actually a pretty great compendium of all kinds of weird stuff. Hmm. And I, I, that was probably my introduction to a lot of uh, odd things. Yeah, I mean, I came across JB and Louisa Ryan via that book, and then I was kind of hooked on the ideas behind parapsychology. And, you know, there were, I had it in my head that I wanted to become a parapsychologist that young. So I can show my age a little bit. When I first saw Ghostbusters and saw the Zenner cards, you, you know, the first scene in the first movie where Venkman's running a uh, ESP test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember, like, I was probably five or six when I saw that, but I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, Zenner cards, these guys are legit. So I might not be familiar with the interior of Reader's Digest, but I do know uh, the name you mentioned there, J.B. Ryan, one of the forefathers or the forefather of parapsychology. Yeah, I mean, there were different iterations of what you could call parapsychology prior to that. I mean, the term psychical research was used a lot before Ryan, but he actually got academic funding and stuff at Duke University to really pursue research seriously and academically into ESP. To a lot of people's minds, including Keel, adequately proved the uh, existence of it back then. So we're talking, I think, like the 30s, 40s and on. I think if there is anything to, you know, anomalous phenomena and the paranormal, I definitely do think that it is psychological that it's mental it's something to do with the mind so that's definitely the area of research that i'm very into and i would focus on the most yeah and i mean like i said for my own part for my own encounter i i considered it something ghostly having to do with actual ghosts and then always kind of teetered between something psychic psychical something parapsychological or something um ghostly and it never occurred to me that there were parallels until actually fairly with uh with like ufo abduction sorry ufo abduction lore and uh <laughs> bringing it back and actually elementals and fairy lore there's so many different ways you can consider these things because when you see how these things based on like perception and like the subjective views of people and how they sort of conform and sometimes establish and perpetuate folklore you have nothing else to conclude other than that they have to be in some way related to the mind or that it is just fictional folklore stories you know i think it has to be one or the other it has to be purely uh fictional purely just something that human beings do or it's something that people do that is influenced in some way by some you know spiritual entity or consciousness beyond our understanding but are any of those things more real than the others is yeah, that's the question. the question though right yeah. The way I look at it is that the mysteries that we have exist purely to fulfill the function of being mysterious. Mm -hmm. So the mysteries compel us, the mysterious nature of it compels us to come up with a solution, which inspires us to come up with the stories, inspire us to investigate more and actually see these things in real life, you know? Yeah, well, definitely what I was hinting at before is the idea that sometimes hoaxes can become real and uh, fiction can turn into something that people are actually seeing. But, um, you know, the idea of consciousness that is an extension of humanity's consciousness, like a collective unconscious zeitgeist kind of thing, that also is an option of what this could be. It could just be entirely human. Yeah, it, it could be the mingling waters of alternate realities as well. It could be a consciousness field coming from somewhere else. I'm not going to define the somewhere else, but there's a sphere of that that where part of that that sphere that overlaps with our sphere. Yeah, and maybe I mean, that can be accessed through dreams or visions or or the kind of uh, psychical manifestations that you're talking about. To your point before about the the alien that which is strange or bizarre or uncanny it definitely is uh, what we encounter is specifically to our conception of what is alien or what is uncanny you know um, like everyone's alien to someone or everything as well could be alien in the right context so the anomalies and encounters that people report are often just based on what society or the social zeitgeist at the time would consider to be alien
Yeah, it has a lot to do with context and the situation, for sure. Yeah, the, the the uncanniness factor for me is is huge. I was just thinking about that earlier today, where your mind races to make sense of something that you see that you don't have a language for. You don't have a word for it. But what you were saying before is the, the idea that's like to drive people on, that's to get people interested and keep them interested and keep it going. I do think that that seems to be part of it, that it's keeping them there, keeping them watching the skies and trying to interact. Uh, there's the idea that John Keel talks about that these things are there to establish and perpetuate narratives. They're there to build up these narratives by which to kind of control mankind, uh, you know, psychologically through the establishment of, you know, beliefs and things like that, like the whole UFO narrative, the whole Sasquatch narrative, various religions and afterlives and spiritualities that people talk about. Um, you know, that's the whole Trojan horse idea that it is um, a trick. Yeah, I mean, that absolutely could be. That's kind of Charles Fort's we are property idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're livestock, I think he said. But I mean, you can look at it in a more positive way as well. And ultimately, if it is a consciousness based thing, slightly tweaking that perception to a more positive bent. Yeah, that would make it uh, the divine. If you were to take the idea that there is some universal consciousness, what people would call God. So that way, by being interested in the anomalies and researching these things, you're engaging in like a meditative exercise in contemplating the nature of the divine. So you're actually engaging with this consciousness that is the universe by looking at those weird little lights in the sky. Yeah. That's a more positive perspective. You know, I like to hear out all the different uh, interpretations. Well, ultimately, it's like, following a trail of breadcrumbs that leads you back to yourself uh it's a journey of self-discovery most of the time helps you build upon yourself is the way i tend to look at it your opinions change i'm sure you've experienced this in your research mm -hmm. there was a time in my life where you start reading about a case and it sounds really cool and then you find out it was a hoax and you go ah and you just cast it aside ah damn it it's a hoax you know then yeah. eventually you start enjoying those hoaxes because sometimes the hoax is just as interesting as the legend you know mm -hmm. and, and the story be a behind what motivated them to make the hoax and then you find out they're so multifaceted in so many layers and you build and expand as a person you become more forgiving you become more open-minded you learn to have a sense of humor about these things and you just develop upon your own personality so i mean what's more divine than improving upon yourself becoming a bigger you know being a better person yep i feel that way about the men in black mythology when i first was looking into that i think i felt that there was more to it that it was actually some kind of like genuine anomaly that began with Val bender but looking more into you know the relation of like uh, Albert Bender and Ray Barker and kind of how the the story propagated. I do think more and more that it kind of is just personified paranoia that it is the the boogeyman of the UFO field kind of um, you know making mountains out of molehills based on a very small kernel if there is any kernel at all of truth. You know, I thought like this must be one of the the big things, but then the more I look into it, the more it kind of starts to fall apart. Yeah, and yet the le the legend endures. Although I don't know how many people actually report running into MIB anymore. It seems like it, they've already been displaced. It's kind of maddening in a respect because people don't even recognize them from the old stories. But whatever, they were terrifying. I'm glad I've never met one. Yep. <laughs> To my point, what I was saying before, um, there's a book called Cosmic Witch by Susan Demeter. Are you familiar with this one? Uh, I think I've seen photos of it on Twitter. Yeah, it's relatively recent because while well, the cover is great, it was designed by Miguel Romero. And she, she looks at encounters with the anomalous as being an initiation, mm -hmm. which is a really cool idea to me. It's like having, having a, UFO, a UFO sighting has an effect similar to being initiated into like a secret order or something like that. You kind of automatically are now initiated down a life path that's going to, to change you and metamorphose you into a different, more magical being. You know, I would definitely agree with that. That's kind of the whole concept of the contactee or the experiencer. They go through some weird things in their lives. And I've met multiple people who talk about how they have a weird experience and then it opens their mind and they're, you know, exploring things they never thought possible. So definitely would agree with that concept. Yeah, as long as you don't go joining a cult. Uh, yes, definitely. Read Valet's Messengers of Deception. Absolutely. Remain always remain always skeptical. Question everything. Yeah, I always re recommend Messengers of Deception to people. Yeah, I mean, no gurus. Yes, we don't want any all, guru. Question all gurus. No UFO gurus. Okay. Nobody's infallible. We're all just trying to figure it out. Well, if you compare the um the like really old lore of, you know, mystery schools or even more modern secret societies, there is like, you know, your initial 
initiated by like an encounter with the goddess or the encounter with something mysterious and strange. And so it is the same concept, except for it's the quote unquote phenomena doing it instead of a, a group doing it, you know. Yeah, yep, no, I agree with that totally. We're on the same page there. To put a cap on the whole divine thing we were talking about, I want to make this clear. The whole concept of negative and positive uh, is just subjective morality. So you want to consider the phenomena to be like good or bad. I think it really is based on, you know, your conception of what is good and bad. Even the trickstery things, people could look at that as like, oh, well, it's for some end that justifies the means or it's uh, more playful with trickster things or, you know, the big picture and all that sort of thing. The whole concept of is the divine good or bad is um, a big philosophical concept, but I think it is more subjective based. So there are people who would consider the, the UFOs and the, the weird things that go on, the anomalous phenomena to be a good thing. And then there are those uh, typical like, demonologists and stuff who consider all of it to be a bad thing. And then the various shades of gray between that. So it, that really is up to you. But I, I think the phenomena is more uh, bittersweet. It's more uh, gray kind of like the ending of Childhood's End. It's got a, a bittersweet ending that is more kind of up for you to decide if that's the, the good ending or the, you know, the end that mankind deserves or should be going towards. Yeah, it's always marginal. It's it's always kind of in that liminal zone, right? So it's just barely out of reach. It's always something that you're hot on the trail of and never catching. So... <laughs> Have you read Childhood's End, uh, like 1953, Arthur C. Clarke? No, actually, I don't. Uh, I read a lot of Clarke when I was younger, but I don't think I ever read that one. John Keel recommends it several times throughout his life, and he quotes it in the opening pages of the Mothman Prophecies. Oh, and, right, right, okay. Like, the whole book is kind of Clarke's ideas of the paranormal back when he was into the concept. He later recanted his ideas of the paranormal and said that this is, you know, just to be taken as fiction. It's another one of those blurring the lines between fiction and uh, theory. So he talks about these these UFOs appear in the sky, and then there is the flying creatures who have horns on their heads. They kind of look like what we would think of as devils or demons, and uh, Kiel kind of compares them to the Mothman. Then all the children of the Earth become psychic, and they also contact the beings through Ouija board. So there's a lot of um, occultism mixed with UFOs in that book. It ends with uh, kind of what you would consider like an apocalyptic event. It ends with, you know, the final stage of man's evolution, childhood's end, where everyone melds into one consciousness and joins the overmind, which would be like the phenomena. They all meld into that one consciousness. And so it's left kind of bittersweet, like, should this be mankind's destiny? Does this end justify the means or not? And uh, the beings in the book also are kind of trickstery, like they lie to the people and all that sort of thing. But it's a very interesting idea The all the children of the earth become psychic and they can finally connect to this uh, all-seeing thing in the sky. You kind of see that perpetuate itself too with like the idea of indigo children and star seeds and stuff like that. Yeah, the overmind in the book takes on the form of a giant eye. And I found that interesting because there's, um, in the Muffin Prophecies, Roger Scarberry has a dream about a giant eye floating over Mary Heyer's house. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. So that's like huh. the overmind. But yeah, so John Kill recommended that book, and he seems to think that it's uh, less than fictional. He seemed to think it was more prophetic. Back to ESP, I was going to ask you, do you think that everyone has uh, some extrasensory perception? Because that's that's kind of the, the idea that I would go with, that if there is something like that, it would have to be something that every single person has to um, a certain degree. Maybe some people harness it more and are more aware of it, uh, identify with the label psychic and embrace that. But I think that everyone would have to have it a little bit, you know, as we've seen with the Mothman premonitions and things like that. So what do you think of, of that concept? Uh, yeah, I absolutely think that. Because, I mean... In recent years, I've I've felt myself becoming more psychic, and I hate saying that. <laughs> it's, uh, it feels embarrassing to actually say out loud, mm -hmm. let alone you know, put it on the internet anywhere. But I've always felt like I had some sense of intuition, at least, and I've had plenty of premonitions in the past, you know. But I think everybody has that to some degree, and it's a matter of whether you recognize it or or develop it. And I suppose some people are naturally way more in tune. Uh, it kind of gets to the idea that Colin Wilson expresses in his book, The Occult of History. He calls it Faculty X. You know, his, his whole thesis is that Faculty X is something that every human being has. And as we developed more into the luxury of having a society and having things done for us and less danger, we kind of lost Faculty X along the way. 
you know, it was originally there to give us a heads up that there's a predator in the area or a warring tribe or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. um, or a natural disaster that you wouldn't be able to. But now we have like the weather channel. So we don't need faculty X to tell us that a storm is coming. The concept goes all the way back to like the ancient Greeks with like the oracles and stuff like that as well. Yeah. And various forms of divination that they used and all that. But um, yeah, most cultures have some kind of divination. Yeah. And some kind of, you know, holy person or or a person that's kind of like a seer or a sage but yeah no i think i think anybody can have uh, these abilities sometimes tools are helpful so Mm -hmm. i think tarot is a tool that helps you tap into that or for others it might be a spirit board or a pendulum something like that i feel i love the old hands-on tools like that but if you want something more modern you can get an app on your phone I think that most people have had some kind of like premonition like experience. Um, oftentimes it's not when they're even trying to do anything. They'll just have some feeling and, you know, sometimes it could be like a very important moment in their life or just randomly they'll know the oddest of details. So I think that most people experience that kind of thing. It just depends on if you read into that or not. Yeah. I mean, most people would just consider it a coincidence, right? Mm -hmm. But then some people have it more often, you know? Yeah. Like for me, I have whole runs where I'll be like stupidly psychic for a while. And it's a little maddening because it's like you feel like you're out of phase with reality or something <laughs> you know you'll just think of something and then it'll appear in front of you i've heard of other people talking about this where you have premonitions of the most mundane things sometimes it'll happen where it's something pretty dramatic like you know something's about to happen i basically just kind of say i'm rarely surprised by things anymore because i always feel like i have some kind of intuitive sense that things are about to happen but yeah no i do think just about everybody does and i'm very into uh divination so i kind of see people who have to have some natural ESP or psychic ability. I kind of look at them as people who are doing divination without the tools. No, so that's kind of how I feel about where I'm at. Cause I, you know, I read tarot for years and used pendulums and did different things, but I started to realize at some point that I would notice things in my day to day life that seemed to stick out for me. And I would think about it a little bit and be able to divine meanings just from things that I saw while out and about. I started jokingly calling them messages from the cosmos, but it's actually developed into its own form of divination for me where I feel like I don't really need the cards. Like that was almost like training wheels. If you go with the idea of divination, the idea is, you know, based on the divine, they think they're communicating with the divine force in the universe. People who are into like the psychic thing would be more into the idea that it comes from them, that it comes from their you know, psychology or their mindset or their mentality. Yeah, it's just the dials on the radio of your brain, tuning it in for right frequency. The two different ideas is that one, that it comes from you, but the other idea would be that it comes from outside of you, that it comes from consciousness that is in the universe, the divine, depending on if you consider that to be a part of mankind or distinct from it. Right, or it could be both. Indeed, it could be a, an intermingling of that. I like to say that it interfaces with the mind. There is a, a consciousness out there that tells people what to think, and then it bases things off of, of people's mentality or their you know the archetypes of their society or whatever is in their brain like if the the message wants to scare them it will go with some kind of primal fear if it wants to comfort them it will go with something that's like innately comforting to people so i, I would say it has to interface with the mind if you wanted to view it that way yeah but but uh, is the, the concept of having extrasensory perception is that based on some phenomena or divine out there or does it come solely from mankind or is it an intermingling is it divination or is it something just human well, I think it has more to do with how time works and being able to tap into that frequency. Like Eric Vargo has some pretty cool ideas about this with retro causality. I'm not sure I agree with all of it. His his ideas rely on deter- determinism in a, in a certain way. Like your your whole life's path is already plotted out. You know, <laughs> I like to think that we still have some free will and agency. Perhaps it would have to nudge people or move people in a certain direction. And uh, that kind of does violate the concept of free will, if you believe in in that concept. But does it, though? Because, like, I've thought about this recently, too. Somebody recently asked me what my craziest idea was. And I said, okay, well, here it is. Like, all prophecies and predictions come true. Suppose you make a prediction about something, something as simple as a coin flip, and you predict heads, but it's tails. But there's an alternate reality that's split off that where it was heads. What if, what if all predictions and all prophecies are true in some way, shape, or form? There wouldn't need to be a strictly deterministic, fatalistic universe like that. Yeah. 
But if you buy into some of the, the unified theories that there is a, a force at work that manipulates mankind through narrative like folklore stuff like spirituality, then you could say that via them manipulating these cultures, they're leading them towards some destiny. They would then know what's going to happen and that will influence this and, you know, the different cultures being told different things by their gods. I mean, I've always kind of pictured time as unfolding like a coil or a spring and there is one end and there is the other end. And, uh, you know, maybe it never does end. Maybe it never does begin. Maybe it's all a circle. But whatever the case, I think that there is a overall deterministic path that everything has to be on. And what if all of the phantoms, all the monsters, all the MIB, what if all of these things exist to just kick people back into play when they get off the field? It need not be a sinister thing. What if it's there to protect the universe because that's the way it's supposed to be? If you look at divination, most of it's based on randomness. The, the random shuffling of the tarot cards, the scan radios that scan through random stations, the, the way things lay and with like throwing bones or tea leaf reading. So I think there could be something there. there through the interpretation of randomness that we get to these conclusions yeah because i mean uh what is reality but a, a, a series of random events really <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna keep uh, bringing up childhoods in though uh once again because the the concept at the end of the book is that those children are like the chosen like they're the last generation and they're meant to be the ones to meld with the overmind so if you think about that it could be every single generation is guided in a certain way to eventually reach that final generation which is the right generation generation to be uh, assumed into the consciousness there. You know, that's a, a very big fatalistic idea, but the idea that it's leading mankind towards some uh, final cosmic destiny that is ambiguous as if it's good or bad. But that's, uh, I would say, it's probably more neutral. But that's the, the concept of this guiding principle, this Trojan horse that is manipulating mankind to some final end, some final end that is unknown, but talked about by Arthur C. Clarke there. I was always more of a Bradbury guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a lot of sci-fi writers who are very uh, Fordian. You know, there's also, uh, what's that guy, uh, Phil K. Dick. He writes yes. about uh, a lot of Fordian stuff. Uh, I think Heinlein does as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Strangers in a Strange Land is a fantastic book. Stephen King actually based his book uh, Carrie off of Wild Talent by Charles Fort. And um, his mother used to read him Fate Magazine before he would go to sleep at night. Yeah, I remember reading about that. Uh, yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, Fake Magazine is another example of like fiction becoming reality because it started off uh, as like somewhere for Ray Palmer to publish his, uh, you know, supposedly true stories like the Schaefer mystery. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of the sci-fi fans were getting fed up with that stuff being in amazing stories. <laughs> yes, so that was the birth of Fate Magazine and of course the first issue being Kenneth Arnold. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I've got one more thing to talk on ESP. I did a, a, a sort of an experiment, but not really. I don't have any Zinner cards, so I just took regular cards, and uh, I tried to guess the, the suits of them, you know, like spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs. I took 52 cards, and if I got the card right when I was guessing what suit it was, I would put it in one pile, and if I got it wrong, I'll put another pile and see how many of them I can get right. The best one I did was I got 20 right and 32 wrong. And I don't know if that is uh, normal odds or not, but that was that was a, a fun little thing to try to do. Yeah, I mean, there's a math equation you could use to arrive at that, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, I mean, I guess you'd have a one in four chance at any given time of correctly guessing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, too, because if you look at, like, statistics are kind of an odd thing. Like, what what would be statistically significant for guesses? And if you look at the, both Ryan's studies of things and, uh, like, Keel's idea of the Wednesday phenomena, their, their idea of statistical st significance when you actually look at it isn't all that impressive you know <laughs> sometimes it just skews just a little bit toward one side and they're like well that's you know the odds are that it should be less than that but you have to wonder what what baseline they're using for the odds in that case you know mm -hmm. so, i'd like um, to go through um albert rosales's uh humanoid encounters and just see if each day it lands on a wednesday and kind of do the do the math there and see if it's more on wednesday or not through those kind of books that might be a, a fun thing to try to do when these days yeah yeah that'd be great 
Okay, so my, my next question here is, when did you start your website, and is there any other projects that you work on? Well, I started the website in 2019, I think. I had planned on getting some writing done, and then somebody asked me to be on a podcast at some point, and I figured I, I had better whip up a blog so that I had something uh, to point people. I, I regrettably don't get the time to add to it, as, but I think I have some pretty interesting things on there. Yep, I've read a bunch of the stuff on there about, like, you know, Bugs Bunny and clowns and some very odd things. Yeah, I mean, I kind of tend to go straight for the weirdest of the weird, mm -hmm. which um, that can be time consuming research wise. I have to go buy a bunch of books to, to make those happen. <laughs> so I like to make sure that I check and double check everything. And I rare, rarely rely just on the internet for research on any of the things I do. So yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason. And then life just gets busy and gets in the way with that stuff. I'll put it this way. I'm really happy with everything I write the way, when it ends up on the site. So would you say that's your, your main 40 and expression that uh... Uh, otherwise just personal research and the Magonia group and stuff like that? Yeah, Liminal Earth is a big one for me. I really enjoy being in that group. I actually got to recently meet up with one of the other ambassadors from Liminal Earth, and we did a, a tour of the Gunji Womp Swamp and historical site in Connecticut. Hmm. And uh, the Liminal Earth, for anybody that doesn't know, is the interactive map where you can report sightings and encounters that you've had. I, I really like the flexibility there with that group and what they consider to be weird and significant enough to put it on the map. Like anybody can submit anything in as long as as long as it passes our criteria of acceptable for the site it basically just means not offensive or awful like it, it gets on the site there's a lot of really cool stories on there you can just look at your local area and see what people have reported there the more stories we get the better so i like to help out with that that's a big part of it otherwise i just research little odd things here and there and then end up talking about them on podcasts do you do a lot of like legend tripping like going out to the locations where things happen i try to i mean obviously last year made that really difficult difficult but anytime uh, my wife and I just go for a ride somewhere or we have a particular destination in mind I'm always thinking about stories I've read so that I can pick out a, a place maybe nearby since you recommended uh, a bunch of occult books to me uh, I gotta ask what about your occultic practices what do you do for for that I mean, for the most part, I consider myself a Discordian. I'm very adaptable and can change my mind on any of that at any given time. But there is the tarot side of it. A lot of, I call it kind of like getting into a meditative state with stuff, intention setting sort of things. I don't do anything too high magic or anything like that, but I don't know. Everything I do is more intuitive and kind of doing what feels right. So I don't know that I can uh, adequately define it. I, I, I tend to keep it to myself and my very close friends anyway, most of the time. I don't think so, I was really ready for that question. But okay. so, Sorry, was it too, too guess, personal a question? Well, no, I, I just, uh, I guess I've never really considered what I would call my own personal practices with it. I don't necessarily know how to answer it. But I can give you a, a brief example of uh, weather magic. You do some Ted Owen stuff there? and it manifest a tornado or something? I actually did because uh, I have an SI disc. I managed to get a hold of one. And when I was supposed to meet up, I met up with uh, Luminal Earth Ambassador Kiki Dombrowski in Connecticut. And it had been raining for days up here. And we were supposed to go walking through like a swamp. So everybody's dreading like going on this hike, this guided tour, because it's going to be raining in a swamp and it would be, uh, felt like it was going to be miserable. So I took the SI disc and went outside and, you know, tried to contact the space intelligences through a little bit of self-induced hypnosis and meditation, the way Owens described. When we went down there at 9.30 in the morning, it wasn't raining. And it wasn't raining for the entirety of our little guided tour through the swamp area. So I guess it worked. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I've, I've read uh, How to Contact Space People. That uh, cover art just spoke to me, so I had to go get that. Which yeah, it's an awesome book. I love that book. With the little mantises, like one of them's name is Twitter, you know? So Twitter yeah, Twitter. And Twitter. 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 That, yeah. That's incredible. That's the names of those beings. It's interesting. Yeah, that considering that a lot of the coolest people I've met have been on Twitter, you know. Yeah, and then the other one's Discord, and that's like Discordia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's got to find an alien named MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why that one didn't last, you know. <laughs> yeah, it didn't have the aliens behind it. it. Didn't have the UFO people. The the UFOnauts weren't behind but, it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Personally, the the UFOs are what speaks to me most, but. Do you have a, a topic, like an anomalous topic that interests you most, like be it uh, Sasquatch, monsters, poltergeist? I guess um, yours would probably be parapsychology, no? Yeah, well, I mean, that's where it all began for me. But like all kids that I grew up around, like dinosaurs were huge for me. 
So obviously ideas like Makili and Bembe and uh, Loch Ness Monster were like hugely appealing. So then I got into cryptozoology, you know, it's always been a mixed bag for me. And I've rarely ever drawn serious lines of distinguishment between, you know, my love for sci-fi movies or comic books or flying saucers or the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or any of it, you know, it, yep. to me, it's all just one really big stew and I'm equally enthusiastic about most all of it. Okay. Just the, so, the big mixed bag of uh, Fortean phenomena and high strangeness and all that good stuff. Right. Yeah, exactly. I guess high strangeness would be, it, it, like I said earlier, the weirdest of the weird is always the stuff I'm after, you know? Yep, same. Like, I think Jeff the Talking Mongoose is pretty good as a uh, totem for the type of story I'm looking for, you know? Yes. Uh, a, a strangely famous case there, the Talking Mongoose thing. Yeah, I mean, and because it's so bizarre, right? It's kind of a poltergeist story, but it, it also kind of defies uh, categorization easily, unless you want to believe it was all a hoax. So were you aware that Jayon Hynek was the guy who came up with the phrase high strangeness? Because he actually coined that phrase, and I found that out. and wasn't aware of that before. Yeah, I think he added that on to his classification scale, right? Mm -hmm. He was yeah. talking about like cases that were very dreamlike. So that's like the official definition of that phrase is cases that are beyond what we would understand. I mean, it's very dreamlike, weird, even for the people who do weird things. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a really great category, I would say. Yeah, I mean, to me, the key to understanding any of it, whatever there is there to understand, is probably in those absurd cases that literally nobody would want to take seriously, except for maybe those of us that are way out there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about a guy like Ted Owens, who talks to space bugs in his mind, and then uses that ability to control the weather, I mean, that sounds patently crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> So have you ever um, go in the woods looking for a Sasquatch or go into a haunted house waiting for the spirits? Or is it just, you know, sort of mysterious things happen in your life uh, already? Yeah, I mean, the phenomena tends to come find me. I don't necessarily need to go looking for it. Hmm. Uh, have you have you ever interviewed a witness? A few times, yeah. I've tried to do that for Liminal Earth, just collecting stories. Gotten a few really good ones from around here. Yeah, that's what I'd like to get back to doing, to try to, you know, find people who've seen weird things and document it. Yeah, yeah. It's um can be tough sometimes, though. Finding them is the hard part. I guess you got to hang a shingle out and say, tell me a weird story. But <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got a public email now, and I've been trying to get people to send me their weird sightings, but uh, haven't come up with anything yet. So an empty email. I well, about my advice to you would be go old school. Old school still works really well and make some print off some hand bill flyers and hang them in public places. I thought about um, renting ad space in the newspaper. Yeah, do that, too. That'd be awesome. And then send me a clipping of it. <laughs> yep, that would be cool. So for, for now, I've just been advertising on Twitter, but come up dry on that. So any other tips and tricks on how to locate things? Just go old school, maybe? Find some, some of the older folks who have seen some stuff? Yeah, man. And uh, well, I mean, I'm serious about that. Print off some flyers and put them in like coffee shop windows or like type tape them to light poles and stuff like that i'm sure yeah. i did that in uh in high school back when i had the mothman wiki i uh printed off flyers with a picture of mothman that says have you seen me and it has mothman and it has the wiki link to it below i went around school and hung those up on all the lockers and uh the teachers got mad and pulled it down yeah well in a school yeah but um you know, like I've toyed with this idea before of developing, getting something with a QR code, you know, and uh, and that way, like anybody with their phone can go right to that link. You know, I kind of su I suggested that for Liminal Earth. Maybe we can we haven't implemented it yet, but yep. it would be great to just have like a flyer that says like want to read something weird. And then the QR code just takes them to a random point on the map, you know, okay. <laughs> I think yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah, so I'll, I'll work on some some adverts and stuff. If if you've been contacted, contact me, Appalachian Oddity. Yeah, yeah, well, you gotta come. Yeah, okay. come up with something really quirky and attention grabbing. You know. So. Um, one other thing I was gonna say because you mentioned Loch Ness, and I know that we are both big uh, Ted Holiday fans. I saw you have an article about that. That was the first thing I tackled on on the blog. Was I decided to do a um, a post every day for a week about Loch Ness, and that that tended that turned out to be kind of a lot, but I managed to do it. Ted yeah, Holiday. Ted Holiday is great. Yeah, I've read um, The Dragon, The Disc, and uh, The Goblin Universe. I also yeah. have uh, The Defined Enigma, but I haven't read that one yet. I really like his um, his philosophy and his unified theories of the Goblin Universe and the Hall of Mirrors and all that. Some really great uh, general philosophy about the phenomena. So I really like that. Yeah, absolutely. And he had some weird men in black encounters himself. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about him is it's like a progression of 
of different thoughts, you know? Yeah, where, he started um, off with like a, a flesh and blood idea of the Loch Ness Monster and then moved on to, uh, you know, more spiritual or manifestation type idea. Right. Yeah, and connecting them to the flying saucers. And then by the time you get to the Goblin universe, he's like built this whole other concept of reality, you know? Yeah, which he later went back on. And it's like, nope, never mind. Well, I mean, he died before the Goblin universe was published, but mm-hmm. he, um, he was, yeah, he was trying to retract that idea and kind of revert back to the more materialistic flesh and blood ideas. Uh, Lauren Coleman and Jerome Clark, they have those two books, The Unidentified and Creatures from the Outer Edge. And in the introduction of that, they also say like, hey, these are these ideas are outdated. Don't take these too seriously because they have right. more of a uh, heel like manifestation idea in their early right. books from the 70s. Yeah. And then the, they kind of go more traditional 14 open to a lot of possibilities, you know, so they they don't want anybody taking it as gospel, you know. Yeah. So you see the same thing with uh, Ted Holiday there. And I mean, that book almost didn't get published. Published posthumously by Colin Wilson. Yeah. And actually, although he wasn't credited with it, Lauren Coleman helped out with that as well. The In Lauren Coleman's A through Z, he actually says the Goblin universe was coined by John Naper in the book Bigfoot. Oh, okay. So it actually like starts off as kind of like a flesh and blood, uh, tongue in cheek idea. Kind of like Jayon Hynek, who was like high strangeness being something that's beyond the norm. Uh, Goblin Universe was kind of like beyond the norm for like Bigfoot and stuff like that. And then it goes into Loch Ness Monster with Ted Holliday there. Yeah. Yep. Ironically laying the groundwork for the uh, non-flesh and blood ideas there. Yeah. Ex- well, yeah. I mean, they have a way of coming back around again. It's the merry-go-round I was talking about before mm-hmm. where people think people have a novel idea and you're like, well, I think of other people that have that same idea at different points. You know, it just seems to always go around and around, you know. Yeah. The, the uh, idea that Keel has of the ultra terrestrials, he said he borrowed it from Sanderson and I tried to figure out what the heck he was talking about. But if you read some of Sanderson's books about Bigfoot, he talks about the ultra hominid. He's talking about like Sasquatch or like ape creatures that exist on earth they're like kind of hidden and so i think keel was taking that idea and playing like playing in a different way saying there is a a species of terrestrials that exist on earth that is hidden you know what i mean so he kind of spun that in a different direction so i think that's what he means when he says borrowed it because i looked all over sanderson's books for ultra terrestrial the only thing i found was ultra hominid yeah so there's another example of flesh and blood being translated into a more metaphysical concept yeah that's all cool stuff What's the best way to communicate with the phenomena, in your opinion? Well, I think honesty plays a lot into it. It has a lot to do with your intention and your perception, like I was saying before, but being honest with yourself about what it is that you expect to see or uh, not being selfish about it. Like you said, it's all various aspects of consciousness and if you're going to interact with the phenomena at all, you have some level of peace with yourself or you're going to have a really bumpy ride. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I mean are, are you talking about the mechanics of it more or like uh, uh, open, a lot? Kind of just an open question. Uh, like what kind of methods, uh, perhaps, if you wanted to go into that as well? Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes these things just happen via dreams. I, I recommend meditation or divination, different practices like that that just kind of get your mind off of the everyday Yes, which is the purpose of a of a sighting or a strange thing is to take you beyond the norm to disrupt normalcy with something that is alien. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I would definitely recommend uh, divination and meditation as well as to get you in that mindset and get familiar with the concepts of talking to something that is beyond you or that seems to be beyond you. Yeah, you really kind of, you have to lead into it too. I mean, if you have hesitation about it or overthink it or uh, fill yourself with doubt, then then you can kind of counteract that whole process. I think you could probably yeah. could just uh, start anywhere because, you know, multiple people get their starts in different ways. And as Charles Fort said, you can measure a circle beginning anywhere. So right, exactly. start off yeah. with some method of divination. I'm a big fan of the Ouija board. Ouija board is so cool. A talking board. We've had some discussions yeah. about that. Yeah, I love your... Uh, your spirit board collection that you have I, i'm like no don't start a new kind of collection <laughs> don't ever with the house <laughs> but I, I already collect so, so many weird things um do you have any haunted items in your house any haunted items yep items you would consider haunted well i do have a cursed clown painting i don't think it's actually haunted though i have a last rites or sometimes called sick call kit like crucifix have you ever seen these before yeah i think they like fold out and they have candles that go in and yeah like exactly thing. i've seen yeah, it would hang on the wall and then if somebody was really sick and near death you could 
open it up and pray for them and light the candle and stuff like that. I have one of those. I've kind of always had it. I never really like questioned where it came from, but it was in my house growing up. It was in my bedroom when I was like a teenager. When I moved out, I took it with me. I kind of learned years later that my mother actually bought that when I was young because she had a priest come to the house and bless the place because of all the poltergeist activity going on. And and then that's why she was hanging that on the wall. She actually didn't even know it was like a sick call kit. She just thought it was a, a cross, you know. The whole purpose behind Behind that was to knock down the paranormal activity in the house so it's not exactly a haunted item but it's got like a haunted history so do you uh do you ever seek out haunted items or like encountered uh, interesting haunted items or? i don't know that i would really want to you know <laughs> i always kind of wondered about that ed and lorraine warren they had their occult museum which was really just in their house it was like a basement room of their house <laughs> and you're just kind of like wait so if these things are really as haunted as you're saying why did you bring them home how is your house not upended from it you know friend steve in moundsville he has like a paranormal museum as well that's just full of like haunted items and stuff like that and uh, he actually has one of those crosses and he has a bunch of dolls and things like that he collects like funerary mortuary items embalming pumps and old coffins and things like that so that's, that sounds awesome i mean i'd love to see it i'm always regretting not going to the uh, the warren's museum when it was open because uh, it's actually not that far from me I don't know. I would think that if I had a troublesome haunted item, I'd have to figure out what to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. To to keep it from disrupting my life. I, I don't think any of the things I have actually are haunted, you know? Hmm. Well, I would go for some haunted items. I think I, I would enjoy the company. <laughs> yeah, but when you got like, uh, you know, I have I have family members to consider here that yeah. might not agree with yeah. that. So Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I do have a piece of Boleskine House. Some what? Pieces of Boleskine House. The house that Aleister Crowley lived in on Loch Ness. Oh. But yeah, that's where Crowley did the um, higher guardian angel Abramelin ritual, you know, and yep. which some people think created the Loch Ness monster. But mm -hmm. And there was the, the lamb thing, which is people attribute that to the graves as well. Yeah, exactly. But the Bluskin house was where he did it. And then, uh, you know, Jimmy Page lived there later and supposedly did some weird occult stuff. And then cool. it's burned down several times. So they're in the process of restoring it now. So I have a couple of stones and some of the ashes from it that I have in a display case. Hmm. And when I first got that, people on Twitter were like, oh, I wouldn't bring that into my house. It's probably all haunted and stuff. And I'm just like, I don't know. It's just kind of a cool relic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the proceeds went to helping to rebuild the place. So that's cool cool too you know mm -hmm. so yeah I, I like haunted items and things that have some sort of like sentimentality to them and i really don't like when people like fear monger over stuff like that with the ouija boards uh even people who consider themselves paranormal investigators or even people who consider themselves witches will sometimes cower in fear of this piece of cardboard with the alphabet on it yeah i mean you, you must encounter a lot of that my, my friends they were selling like ouija board mouse pads and i was there at their table and people were freaking out about just a mouse pad had a symbol like the ouija board on it so yeah yeah people are just terrified of it ever since the exorcist i think yeah well i would get that for people who are like not into the paranormal but for people who consider themselves like paranormal investigators and stuff like that it doesn't really make sense to me that they would have a problem with that specific form of divination if they don't have a problem with like pendulums and all that what's the big deal with the planchette I think I think the Warrens played a huge part in that, actually. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cultural reasons why, but I just mean like, you know, not yeah. like actual sense reason why there isn't one. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, it is the fear mongering thing, which I'm really against, you know, like, I don't mean to call it out, really, but the podcast, I really enjoyed listening to that for like the longest time, just because I liked hearing people's stories. But then I joined the, the Facebook page. And it seems like so many of them are there for like a campfire story. They just want a spooky story. And then if it's like, if it's not scary, it's not interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, uh, to get to the, like the fear mongering stuff. That's what the way so much of the TV programming is. Whether it's yep. like Zach Bagans yelling about demons or uh, <laughs> monsters and mysteries in America show. I think that's what it was called. All these TV shows, they have this low droning sound that acts on some level like infrasound to make you uh all anxious about the recreation that they're presenting when the person's telling the story if you're really interested in the phenomena you, you want to just hear the story some of them sometimes it's stories you've heard before that it didn't occur to you that it was a scary story but then they show it on tv and they have to make it scary for tv because that's what people are there for yep. it's kind of 
maddening to me, the whole fear mongering aspect of it. And that's something I really like to put back against whenever I get the chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, with the Ouija board thing, I was trying to point out kind of like the, the unreasonableness of like, if you have like a mat or a board that has the alphabet on it, but then you use a pendulum, people will be okay with that. Like, Oh, that's a pendulum mat. Right. But the moment you introduce a planchette, suddenly that's scary for whatever reason, but you could also just use a normal planchette with like a pin you know, like they have those writing planchettes that can draw. Uh, people are sometimes okay with that. But they're not okay with the two objects put together. It kind of shows that it's just a cultural thing. It's not like any sense made. There's nothing more frightening about communication through a board than there would be communication through like a scan radio. You know, people are like, yeah, let's use a spirit box, but not that we just step. An unreasonable thing that I'd like to yeah. see kind of go away and be more accepting, you know, because people yeah. used to use those with no fear back in the day, like a do-it-yourself mediumship spiritualist type thing. Absolutely. I and mean, it's really interesting to consider like the overlap between early contactees and spiritualism because so many of them used those kinds of methods, you know? Yeah, I think uh, theosophy is kind of the bridge between spiritualism and the UFO contactees. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. Uh, experiences with the Ouija board. When I first started doing it, I, I I would get communication from beings that didn't have any name. It'd be like nameless entities, like what's your name, and it would like move off the board or wouldn't answer or say no and like that. So I got a lot of like nameless communication. I would I would do it by myself with like a shot glass or like a uh, like a candle holder, like a glass candle holder, and it would move like very slightly. And mm -hmm. uh, then I would start doing it with um, you know whoever I could convince to join in my Ouija board antics, to convince some people to play Ouija board with me, which is a very difficult thing to do unfortunately but yeah. um the the nameless thing kept coming through again so it's just nameless then i did one uh as a collaboration in the tnt area and i got a really weird communication with uh, a being that we named maybe because it kept spelling out maybe instead of yes or no and mm -hmm. uh we asked if it was like a nature spirit or something because we asked like it was a, if it was alive if it was a person like before and it's like no no and so we asked you with a nature spirit that said yes. So that's uh, one of the communications that at least had some kind of character and name to it. Uh, then it got more weird. Uh, another collaboration I did in the uh, Haunted Low Hotel in Point Pleasant that I told you about, which is yep. with the uh, Sam or Samuel Enoch character. It was essentially this like, uh, claimed to be a dragon or dragon like it had wings because we were using a mothman board and so we kind of just like circle around the wings and uh you know it would avoid questions and go off board and all that sort of thing and yeah i remember for, something with a multi-headed dragon i went to magonia uh, to the group there and i asked if anyone knew anything about uh, like a, a seven-headed dragon you came back with some some welsh folklore about uh multiple headed dragons yeah uh, and of course, it also go to like the Book of Revelations so, like a seven head dragon, things like that. It was kind of hard to pin one down because there's so many legends with several headed dragons, but to get the number right. <laughs> a yeah. little difficult. But... We asked what it looked like. That, that was actually what we said. We said, what animal do you look like? And it spelled out dragon. Like that was an animal. Huh. So so we think it might have been like some kind of like trickstery sort of thing. But it was some interesting answers actually had like a name and a character once again. So I think that that might be, you know, as you get better with the Ouija board, or characters start to emerge perhaps yeah for sure uh, and then we asked how old it was and it said 93,000 years old and this was before I knew anything about uh, like Thelema which has the 93 as a thing yeah and um Lastly, the, the Book of Enoch, which I hadn't really read. I've, I'm interested in uh, apocryphal texts, but I haven't like read all of them. That one's about like fallen angels and stuff. It's kind of like the origin story for the, the fallen angels and the Nephilim. So we thought maybe that would be connected because it's like a winged creature. Yeah. Um, but one I found recently about the Book of Enoch is the one of the, the main lead angels in that book is called uh, something like pronounced like that. Maybe it's just the first three letters there because we thought it would be like Samuel. Yeah. Oh, it's really interesting. Okay. And then the, the next one, this is a, the latest time I've been able to uh, convince some people to use a Ouija board with me is uh, when I got the name Hawthorne. And I asked you about that. And you came back with a lot of uh, folklore info on that. Yeah. I mean, the Hawthorne stuff had a lot of, um, seemed to be kind of all over the place, but uh, uh, always being kind of significant. Again, that was a while ago. So now. Yeah. You informed me that it uh, was, had like some relation to fairy lore that signified an entrance to the other world. And so I right. took that to be pretty meaningful. Yeah. Um, at but, first and, I did. and there are biblical correspondences as well. So Yeah. You said yeah. it was uh, a biblical character. Joseph had like a staff that was made out of hawthorn wood. Yep. And it was used in some places to hypothetically kill vampires. Yep. All I knew is it, yep. it would be like a tree or a bush or something. I wasn't even sure like 
what kind of thing it was. But yeah, so that that was yeah. a, a weird one. That was my latest Ouija adventure. <laughs> well, that's all cool stuff. I'm glad that there's uh, still developing things going on with that. Have you have you done any more very recently with that? Or no, because I can't really uh, can't really convince people to, to play it and stuff like that. I'm hoping to um, to hit the road more recently because I'm fully vaccinated now. So I'm hoping to go collaborate with more people and maybe convince them to play a Ouija with me. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's hard to do by yourself. So <laughs> keep me updated about that. I want to know what's going on. So yeah, definitely. Have you ever had um, full on conversations over a talking board or anything like that? Uh, we did it one time in the house I grew up in. Um, but my mother had that fear of Ouija boards that you were talking about. So mm-hmm. um, Ouija phobia. Ouija phobia. So um, <laughs> we had to make our own like out of poster board. And we used, I think, like a magnifying glass to as a planchette. And uh, just let that slide around. It was in the afternoon, so we, in order to make the room dark, we had to turn off the light and pull the blinds down. And we were too scared to um, pull them all the way down. So we had the blinds like halfway down, but we pulled them all the way down in the other room. Uh, as soon as we started, my friend said, uh, if there's a spirit present, give us a sign. And the blinds fell down, they, you know, just kind of let go and went all the way down in my room. You know, that's just gravity, like the string lets go or whatever, and the blinds fall down. But then the blinds went up in the other room. So, like, you know, that requires somebody pulling on the string to pull the blinds up, you know. So that was uh, that was pretty crazy. That was kind of significant poltergeist activity. As far as the actual talking to the board, I, I don't really recall much of the conversation at all. But we were trying to uh, determine what spirit was behind, like, the poltergeist activity that was going on at my house. Uh, I've actually had a uh, poltergeist experience in my house uh, pretty recently, like 2020, 2021. I think a lot of people have had it from like being stuck inside. Well, it's because of those damn Ouija boards. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what they, <laughs> they want you to think. Anyway, so uh, the poltergeist activity in my house is in 2020, I, um, I awoke to the doorknob on my door turning, like as if it was going to be open, like it's like pushing and turning as if the, yeah. they were trying to open it, but they couldn't open it and it wasn't locked. So that was a, a weird thing I woke up to. Yeah, that's a classic. And then uh, an orb of light flew over my head in the bathroom when I went and clicked on the light. Just a, an orb of light that just kind of shot across the room. And that was really weird. Yeah, I think I think I remember you talking about that in the Discord. But yeah, that's a cool one. Mm-hmm. Ball lightning. Yeah, yeah. And it's not too different from my experience as a kid where, I mean, that's really what it looked like was kind of too amorphous globs of light Mm -hmm. not quite an orb but that that was that was kind of what i was talking to my mother said that when i was like four years old uh an orb of light entered the room and circled around my head so that's a pretty cool like thing there yeah yeah well i guess we have that in common (laughs) did did you also have like circling around around you or something like that well no i mean the full story of that is that after they asked me a few questions they started to drift out the window and it was like upsetting to me like i didn't want them to go you know Hmm. um because i wasn't afraid of them at all i was enjoying conversation you know yeah they asked me a bunch of questions about me but i didn't get a chance to ask them anything and as they were drifting out the window i got really tired and fell asleep but i could like see myself passing out onto the pillow um i seemed to just kind of follow them and then Hmm. it brought me to like a future point a couple of years down the road so so i mean yeah i didn't have the circling thing so much but i had the out-of-body experience that seemed to be just kind of following them i'm glad we both had a lot of uh, mysterious uh experiences in our lives uh, my most recent one is i walked by an empty room and heard a gasp like as if i like scared them so apparently i'm scaring the ghosts now oh yeah <laughs> they didn't expect you to walk by right then mm-hmm. that, that's a pretty good one i like that the most cartoonish one I've ever had was uh, a long time ago. I heard like rattling chains outside my window, like full on Scooby Doo haunting. Wow. One question I neglected to ask you was if you uh, had ever seen uh, what you would consider like a, an undiscovered animal or a monster or something like in the woods that you would think of as like a cryptid or something like that. Uh, no, I, I've been asked that a bunch of times, and I guess my answer is I wish. Yep, same here. <laughs> I, always, I always love cryptozoology so much, but I've never seen anything. Yeah. I want to go see the abominable snowman. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'd like to see a lake monster, but they terrify me too, so... Okay, so I got one more experience for you. This is a my, my first and only uh, known UFO encounter. So this was uh, Christmas Eve when I was a little kid, and uh, we were driving to visit relatives. And um, between two mountains, there were three red lights. So we stopped the car, and uh, we look up these red lights, and we're trying to figure out what it is. First, we thought it was just like a 
a new cell phone tower, but you know, we found it weird enough to stop the car and look at it. The red lights started moving ever so slightly back and forth, like kind of like swaying back and forth. And so we knew that it wasn't like, you know, on a pole or something like that. But we still thought maybe it was somehow part of the landscape, somehow part of the, you know, what we were looking at there. So we resolved to check back when we got back. So we were going to, you know, look at that same area when we drove back home and see if the lights were still there. So we go on to Christmas Eve, we have a nice Christmas Eve, open presents and all that with our relatives. And then on the way back, we look at the, the two mountains and the lights are gone. So they were not a part of the environment there. So... I am left to assume that those were, you know, some kind of odd lights in the sky, otherwise known as a unidentified flying object. Or a UFO. Indeed. Yeah. Well, that wasn't anywhere. Where were your relatives? Was it still West Virginia? Yes, or... it was in West Virginia. Because it made me think of, like, the brown mountain lights, sort of. It's also the second story I've been told today that it occurred on a Christmas Eve. How strange. Mm -hmm. The euphonauts like holidays. Yeah, they do. I mean, you look at like Whitley Strieber's incident was right around Christmas too. Kind of a abduction that started off the whole communion thing. Yeah, well, uh, emotions and stress run high along those times as well. So you could perhaps go down that route and think that it's something to do with that. Yeah, and like the folklore and the kids waiting for somebody to come down from the sky. That kind of energy is just in the air. Yep, so uh, I want to thank you for talking with me and sharing your experiences and sharing your opinions and talking about uh, anomalous phenomena. I just want to say that I really enjoy the comments you leave in the Magonia group. It's rare to find like-minded people who talk about these sort of things. So I really enjoy your way of seeing things and your uh, knowledge of the Fortean Sphere. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me, man. It was a lot of fun. I typically like to end these with a quote, and I typically go to Charles Fort for some quotes. And this is a quote that I had in mind when we were talking about the blurring the lines between truth and fiction. I cannot say that truth is stranger than fiction, because I have never been acquainted with either. Charles Fort, Wild Talent, 1932. Awesome. So is there anything else you'd like to say before I, I close this off? Is there any uh, current projects you're working on or things you should uh, link to or shout out? Hopefully I will be able to get some time for the blog very soon. That's just apstrange.com. Otherwise, just follow me on Twitter and uh, I'll be sure to let people know what I'm up to. Okay. Is there any uh, big intrinsic meaning to that uh, uh, user handle there? It's aficionado prodigiosis. That's a mouthful, so I truncated it to AP Strange. I mean, I just wanted something grandiose and pretentious sounding. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> it is quite grandiose. I, like I was it. looking for like a kind of like a cool occult sounding Latin term, but then I didn't want to be taken too seriously either because I, I have a great fear of being taken seriously. So I just figured aficionado meaning just kind of kind of a connoisseur of and prodigiosus meaning like the strange or um, the outstanding, uh, the remarkable. So check out apstrange.com and uh, thank you for showing up and I will see you in the Magonia Research Group. Yeah, man. See you there. Thanks for watching, and Mountaineers are always free.